I mean, my, my basic takeaway last night was, listen, man, great teams pick their spots. Yeah. You just don't want to give the Rockets any credit. Is that it? Yes, that's it. You know it. You know it. You call Harden Westbrook with a beard. <laughs> You're not about to give him credit now. They're good. They're a, gr- very, they're a great team. No, no, no. They're a very good team. Utah was never a great team. No. Utah was a very good team. And they team. took care of Utah in five games. No, I'm talking like Utah was Stockton and Malone. You can't oh. be a great team and never win a championship, can you? Carolina Probably Panthers not. were a very good Probably team. Probably not. Denver I'll was a great team. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean there's, I, I thought Gary Payton and Sean Kent were very good. Stockton. But they, they are facing one of the best teams we've ever seen. So you, you in, in, in real life, you could be great and not win it just because of who's in front of you. But you're right. Historically, we're not going to recognize a non-champion you, as a you great team. You make up an interesting argument because I consider Phil Mickelson a great golfer, but he couldn't mostly beat Tiger. Yeah. That's fair. By so the way, historically, he might not be recognized as great, but he really was. Jimmy Connors didn't beat McEnroe or Borg much, but I consider Jimmy Connors to be great in tennis. Yep. No, yep. I guess you're right. You you can be great. You could be a great realtor in New York and be the 37th best realtor in New York. True. You'd be a great realtor among the 400,000 people that sell condos in New York. <laughs> so that's so you think Houston's a great team? Yes. Okay, yes. you do. I yes. see him as very good. You see him as great. I Harden, by the way. But they won't be again, they won't be recognized as historically great unless they can win a championship or a few. I want to go back um so take me to your kind of lineage here on cup. So you you uh your first job was at the Akron Bee Journal. My first job covering the NBA. I covered the Cavaliers now, what year in was 1995. That? What year was that? 1995. Okay, so how old was LeBron? Uh, he would have been, when the season started, he was born in 84, so he would have been 10 and then turned When is 11. the first time you heard of him? I was, I had left the Beacon Journal and gone to the New York Times. So this was like 1998 or 99. I was talking to a, cause I was obviously in Akron. So I was, I knew people in LeBron who became part of LeBron's inner circle. I knew people that mentored him. I was probably at some summer league tournaments where LeBron may have played as a kid. Obviously, I didn't know who he was or anything. And so I was talking to one of the guys who mentored him, became part of his inner circle. Not He's not in it anymore, so it's not Maverick Carter or anybody like that. And he told me LeBron was in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. And he said, maybe it was seventh, seventh or eighth grade. He said, we got the next guy, the next Michael, you know, this guy named LeBron James. And I'm like, and he was telling me about how they were playing in these national AAU tournaments and LeBron was just killing everybody, you know, these superior teams and stuff. And then I was like, oh, wow, really? Okay. In my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, whatever. yeah right, Akron, Ohio. <laughs> like, Because Ohio's more of a football state. Sure. Than a, Ohio a, it's state, become more yeah. basketball because of, since LeBron, they've really produced greater players. But, uh, yeah, I was thinking, come on, man. And then – you probably got your first glimpse of him. Yeah, when did I uh, – I mean, I saw – you know, actually the first time I saw LeBron play was like a lot of people when they were on television. Uh, I forgot who they played, but, it, you know, Bill Walton, I believe, was calling the game. It was at St. V, and they televised it. He was a junior in high school? Yeah, he was a junior in high school. And obviously he was tremendous. Um, that was a great – I covered that high school. Before I covered the NBA, I covered high school sports. And that was a great athletic high school. You know, Jerome Lane went there. He was the LeBron before LeBron. The Pittsburgh Panther Yeah, broke guy. the backboard yeah. at Pitt and never really amounted to that much in the NBA, but was a great college player. And they, I mean, they were great in football. They won state in football. I covered their girls team a few years before LeBron was there, and they won state in basketball. So I was very familiar with St. V. Uh, and... You know, LeBron, I was familiar with the school he would have went to, Akron Bookdale. You know, all those high, I mean, I knew Akron so, pretty well. Okay, so you hear, you see. So Brian Windhorst comes out, and he says, man, there's some organizational fatigue, to which I say, what, parade fatigue? Relevant You're right. Fatigue? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know this, man. You and Windhorst, because of your beacon background and because of his background, are the two guys with LeBron. Lee Jenkins also has a very yeah, good relationship. Yeah. I'd bring Brian on, but ESPN won't let me. I love Brian. So you guys, how much of that do you buy? The, 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 the Whitlock yesterday said it's not organizational fatigue. It's LeBron fatigue. Well, LeBron, 
First of all, you don't think there there's organizational fatigue in Phoenix where they've been terrible for like seven straight years? <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like every or, Orlando, there's no organizational fatigue, you know? If they kept their current front office together, there'd be organizational fatigue. They got a new one a couple years ago, but that's neither here nor there. Look, LeBron is very – he is high maintenance because you know the standard he keeps himself to. $1.5 million worth of, you know, uh, training and working out and, and all that that he puts into his body. He holds himself first to a high standard. And thus, he holds everybody else in the organization to a high standard, from the owner to the GM to the coaches to his teammates. So for LeBron, it's championship or bust. And it's the same way for everybody else. And that gets taxing when every year it's win a championship or it's a failure. When every year it's get me the players that I need to compete and win a championship with or it's failure. Yes, it puts a lot of pressure on people. Uh, you, you have to really be at your best all the time. So that in that regard, it does put fatigue on you. And I know in the story it said, you know, they're, they're not developing young players. They're always bringing in vets. Yeah, well, he- of course, because you're trying to win right away. And so uh, I get that. But to, I know you've said it. It's all worth it because you're, com- you're in the finals. When LeBron leaves, let's see how much national TV you're on. You know, let's see how many – Eastern Conference and NBA Finals you're competing for. So it's worth it. And and beyond that, with most successful NBA runs, this happens. Now, it may be elevated today because of social media, I, debate talk shows every single day I, on hey, various I think, networks. Listen, Shaq and Kobe last year. Yes! Week. That wasn't By organizational the way, look, at what, look at what social media has done to the Patriots. Not a peep for 15 years. Yep. In the last two to three years, Instagram has exploded and Twitter's exploded. Exactly. Now the Patriots have issues. Michael Jordan, first of all, was demanding on get me this player, get me that player. He was. wasn't publicized. Like, he, wasn't, he didn't run his organization like LeBron does, and he didn't have the power that LeBron has. But he still, you know, was high maintenance to some degree, a lesser degree than LeBron. But, you know, he's gambling in Atlantic City the night before a playoff game. You know, he punches out Steve Kerr. Like, today, a lot of that stuff would have come out and would have become a big deal. And it would have been on Undisputed and and other shows. They would have been talking about it all day. So when he he retired in 98, it ended kind of up. He didn't have to retire. That was during the lockout year, and Jordan was thinking about coming back. It was based on his Phil going to be back. Okay, so why didn't he come back? Because Jerry Krause had a problem with Phil Jackson, and Jordan, Krause didn't think he got enough credit, so he was resentful kind of of Jordan and all them getting all the credit. So that was organizational turmoil and fatigue. Shaq Kobe, you mentioned. Heck, in Miami – Dwayne Wade left unceremoniously as a free agent a few years ago. Now he's back. But that was fatigue. Chris Bosh was mad with the Heat because they wouldn't clear him to play medically. That was fatigue. I could even go to teams that didn't win championships. You know, uh, Patrick Ewing gets traded from New York, and they've been bad ever since. Why did he get traded? Because Jeff Van Gundy was a coach. Jeff would say, Jeff says one of the hardest things to do is coach a superstar as he begins to decline. And so they traded Ewing. He was going to be a free agent the following year, but they traded him before they lost him for nothing. And because they had brought, you know, he wasn't going to be the focal point yeah. anymore. So again, it was fatigue. I mean, it happens with virtually every great organization the way, and run that they have. It, it, outside of you, too, it virtually happens to every band. Yes, You put a yes. bunch of alphas together, we implode. That's, that's right. That's who we that's are. Right. We implode. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.